there! Welcome to the Global Debate and Public Policy Challenge, in short, GDPPC. First of all, congratulations on making it to task two. In this webinar, we're going to talk about what makes a good policy brief and how you can improve your chances of making it to the Budapest Forum. So take out some pen and paper. You may want to pause this video once in a while so that you can take down some notes. Are you ready? Let's go. Here's what we're going to cover in this webinar. First, we're going to look at the differences between the Task 1 Policy Memo and the Task 2 Policy Brief. It's really important that you don't get confused by the different requirements for each task, so listen closely. Second, we're going to share with you some of the most important things you have to do in order to write a successful policy brief. Third, we're going to walk you through an important checklist that you should use before you submit your policy brief. And finally, we'll wrap up with a quick summary of everything that we will have just talked about. This table is the GDPPC grading rubric. It's what the judges are going to use to grade your paper, and it can also be found in the writing guidelines. The link to that is right below this video. You should study it carefully because it explains all of the criteria that you need to meet in order to be awarded a certain number of points. The first two categories that we're circling in red here make up 60 points out of 100 possible points. They are evidence-based analysis and argumentation, 30 points, and policy recommendations, 30 points. This is what we're going to be covering in this webinar. The other two sections make up 40 points. They are structure, 20 points, and citation, 20 points. These are going to stay the same for both task 1 and task 2. Both are covered in two other webinars, which we really recommend that you also take a look at. So what's the difference between the task 1 policy memo and the task 2 policy brief? This is a really useful table that spells out all of the differences for you. You can also find this table in the Task 2 Writing Guidelines. The first difference you see here is the author. What do we mean by that? For the Task 1 Policy Memo, you had to write from the perspective of a government advisor. It's different in Task 2. For the Policy Brief, you now have to write from the perspective of a non-governmental stakeholder. For example, a think tank, a business, an NGO, a newspaper, and so on. This means that you will be taking on a partisan perspective. Being partisan means that you are a strong supporter of a particular cause. You have a mission. You have a vested interest in the issue, so you are really lobbying for a specific outcome. The availability and audience for Task 2 are also different. Unlike the Task 1 policy memo which was written for government officials, the policy brief is now publicly available. This means that anybody can read it. So your language needs to be less specialized. Think of it this way. Even your best friend and your family should be able to understand everything that you're saying. The word limit is different. For task 1, the policy memo required you to write up to 1,200 words. For task 2, the policy brief is almost twice as long. You need to write between 1,500 and 1,800 words. This gives you an opportunity to expand your analysis by going more in-depth. You should also spend some time acknowledging the limitations to your arguments and rebutting any counter-arguments. And we're going to get to that in a bit more detail later in this webinar. So now let's look at the content. Because the Task 1 Policy Memo was written from a government advisor's perspective, you had to play an advisory role to the government. In Task 1, you had to outline the advantages and disadvantages of several policy options before recommending a course of action. And you're probably really familiar with all of that by now. But now that you're writing from a non-governmental stakeholder's perspective for task 2, the content of your policy brief will be a bit different. You have to analyze the problem, making it sound really urgent so that people will pay attention, lobby, advocate, push for a particular cause of action that would be in your organization's interest, recommend your policies, and convince your readers that your way of seeing and doing things will have a positive outcome, improve the current situation, and benefit many different parties besides yourself. Just another quick reminder, this table can be found in the writing guidelines, so be sure to download it and read it carefully. So how do you write a successful policy brief? Well, there are four main things to always keep in mind. Point number one. 
A policy brief is policy and problem oriented. This means that your policy brief should identify the problem raised by your chosen scenario as clearly as possible. Also, when you're describing the problem, you have to take into account the country that you're addressing. For example, if you choose to address Colombia, you should really spend a lot of time getting familiar with Colombia's situation and tailor your policy brief accordingly. By doing so, your policy brief will be much more action-oriented. What we're trying to say is, the policy brief is not an academic essay, which can be pretty theoretical and focus on things that are not happening immediately right now, today. A policy brief does more than that. It tells us what to do. It is a real-life policy-focused document whose ideas can possibly be adopted into real policies in existing countries. So bring your policy brief to life. Point number two. Policy recommendations are a really important part of your policy brief, and it makes up 30% of your total score. To strengthen your recommendations, you should do the following. When you make a recommendation, spell it out in as much detail as possible. Try to be creative. Come up with innovative ideas so that that sets you apart from the rest of the competition. Tell us, or rather your audience, how your recommendations can and should be implemented in real life. What steps can we take to make your policy recommendations a reality? Nobody's perfect. Acknowledge that your recommendations may not be perfect and that there may be limitations to them. But you should do this in a way that ultimately still makes your recommendations look attractive. Convince your audience. Some of them will be policymakers and you want them to adopt your recommendations. That is your ultimate goal. Let's look at one example of a policy recommendation. We'll do this step by step. The first part is the header, which introduces the recommendation in a short sentence. In this case, the recommendation is that South Africa's legislation should be updated to protect the rights of internet users. Since this is the first recommendation out of a total of, say, three recommendations, we'll label it number one. The opening sentence should state the main point of your recommendation. You could do this in a bit more detail than the example that we have right here. Next, tell us how this recommendation should be implemented. Here, the writer says the Law Reform Commission should be the one to take action by investigating the development of South African law. The writer goes into quite a bit of detail explaining why this is possible. She says it's been done before and what the updated legislation should entail. The writer then explains the positive impact of this recommendation. Namely, that it will protect the rights of South African internet users. And finally, the writer acknowledges that one limitation to this recommendation is that the updated and more rigorous legislation may deter foreign technology firms from wanting to enter the South African market. This is rebutted by pointing out that the government's main responsibility is to act in favor of its people, and not just foreign businesses. This is a slightly different look at the same recommendation. The red highlights are examples from real life that are being used to strengthen this recommendation. The first is a piece of evidence demonstrating that the implementation proposed here has been successfully used before. And the second one refers to two counter examples of legislation that already exist in other countries. The writer uses these examples as a contrast to show that her recommendation has an added value. The lesson to learn here is that your analysis should always be based on some kind of evidence. The more evidence you use, the more relevant and convincing your recommendations will be. It also demonstrates the amount of research that you put into writing your policy brief. Point number three. Your policy brief needs to show that you understand the issues at hand. It should be driven by analysis, which means you need to explain the who, what, why, when, where, how, and all the logical links in between. You need to demonstrate that your approach is the most appropriate and effective way to solve the problem. How can you do that? Well, first, consider other possible solutions that are out there. Point out the weaknesses of those other solutions. 
and demonstrate why those alternatives are worse off than what you propose. Finally, point number four. Your policy brief must be based on evidence. We briefly covered this when we were looking at the example of the recommendation earlier. Your case will be so much stronger and so much more persuasive if you use statistics, studies, and examples from real life to support your arguments. So cite convincing evidence, use reliable and trustworthy sources, and make sure that they are relevant to your policy brief. And you can learn a lot more about citation by checking out our citation webinar. Hey. Even Isaac Newton relied on the studies and evidence of other scientists to make his discoveries. So use evidence. Finally, before you submit your policy brief, here is a checklist that you should use. First, make sure that your policy brief is within the required number of words, not less than 1,500 words and not more than 1,800. Don't worry though, this doesn't include the bibliography. Papers that don't respect this rule will be disqualified which is a huge pity when you've put a lot of effort into writing it. Make sure that you submit your policy brief either as a Word document or as a PDF. Please use a font size of 11 or larger, otherwise the judges will have to strain to read your paper. Make sure you cite all your sources using APA citation style. Citation is a really important part of writing your policy brief, so you need to do this correctly. There's a lot more information on this in the writing guidelines and you can also check out the webinar on citation. Put a page number on each page. Easy. Make sure that you don't have any grammar or spelling errors. Finally, submit on time. Don't wait until the last minute. Plan and write your policy brief well in advance. And you should mark the deadline down in your calendars already so that you won't forget. So what have we talked about? Here's a quick wrap up. Remember to write from a partisan perspective. Recall the four attributes of a successful policy brief and follow the submission checklist before you click submit. For more information, make sure you check out the writing guidelines and the structure and citation webinars. So that's it. Thanks for listening. We wish you all the best and we can't wait to read your policy brief. Good luck.